Got it. Hi, Shane. Hi, Shane. Okay, guys, I am so excited for Lisa to talk to you guys. She has spoken so much life into our family. Um, we met her at a church in Texas, and she blew me away with her knowledge and her stories and her testimonies about deliverance and the devil and oppression. And I'm like, this stuff is real because she brought video. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited for her to share. So I'm going to shut up and just let her take over. And she has free reign to let the Holy Spirit just move. Thank you. Hi, Shane. Good to see you. Good to Listen. see you too. So everybody's getting their, their world rocked. I hear it's been good stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it. Well, thank you, Tammy, for inviting me and uh, welcome everybody that's uh, with us tonight and for those that might be watching this recording later thank you um so it's my understanding y'all been studying on spiritual authority and so i wanted to uh, kind of stay in that vein with you but just to give you a little bit of background um i was not raised in the church as i was uh telling tina I believe yeah tina a while ago uh, i was raised in a small town in oklahoma and uh, i played in dives and bars and you know what that is that's like about 10 steps below a club, right? So anyway, I did that from the time I was 14 and, and I was addicted to alcohol early. And uh, my family was not a real Christian family. My mother took us to a little church that did not preach the gospel. But when I turned 13, I put my foot down, said I wasn't going back. And I didn't, and nobody else did either because nobody was getting anything. So everybody stayed home. But uh, also, you know, my, I had some, some tragic uh, things that happened early on, such as I began to be molested early by a step-grandfather, and in second grade, a demon spirit entered me that was deeply perverse, and uh, this went on for quite some time. Then in fifth grade, uh, my cousins introduced me to Ouija board and introduced me to the occult, and something else entered me at that time, and so when we're talking about demons and it's so weird because you would think when demons uh, occupy a person that they don't have control of their mind, but that's not always the case. In fact, uh, what Jesus talked about was there was a particular kind of devil that uh, required prayer and fasting because it took an unusual amount of faith to get rid of it. And those are usually the ones that make people insane. And um, so there are a lot of people walking around like I was who had uh, some normalcy in their life. But then they had this weird, it was like a second narrative going on inside of the head. And any of you that have ever been oppressed, you know what that second narrative is like. It, it sounds like your own voice, but it has high level suggestions of things that you probably would not think about to do. And so anyway, so those two things really controlled a lot of my early childhood. I had a lot of good things in the childhood, but I had a lot. I became a target. This is another thing about demons. When, when they occupy someone and they own their life, what they do is they bring invitation to the devils that are living in other people's lives. And so if there was somebody, even if, uh, like, for instance, there was a high-level uh, civic leader where I lived that had children, was highly, you know, highly respected and all that, but he molested me. And so he had that spirit on him and it cried out to that spirit that was on me. And so I had this problem through my childhood that people who carried that, uh, they would try to trap me. And so anyway, that, that went on for quite some time. And then, uh, when, you know, my parents had a very rough marriage. And so uh, life was very hard. My father was a truck driver. He was absent a lot of the time as I got older. Um, my mother and father both are dead now, but anyway, um, so when I was 17 years old, um, my mother gave me an invitation to leave the house. <laughs> I had a packed bag, so I took her up on it and I left. And so I went first to my grandmother's, my, my dad's mother, but that was unbearable. And so I just said, I'll take my chance living in the boondocks if I have to. I had an old Ford van and I lived out of that. And I had a friend that was in the band with me. His name was Junior. He was a quadriplegic. He was, he was 29 and I was 14-ish when I met him. So he was my best friend. We played in all the bars together. In fact, he was probably more of a voice of reason than anyone had ever been in my life, but he was as lost as I was. 
So I would stay at his house some, but he had a caretaker who really did not like me and he was afraid she would hurt me. <laughs> it sounds weird, doesn't it? But he was scared she would hurt me. So he was careful how much he let me stay there. So anyway, I washed my hair in the park. I con continued my senior year after I left uh, home. And at the end of my senior year, I had a very supernatural experience with Jesus. I had been to the Baptist church in town with one of my friends, uh, some of my friends over and over again, because in a small town, there's not a whole lot to do. You know, if you're not playing bars or partying or doing raves, you know, uh, sometimes the Baptist church had more going on than anybody and they would do a fifth quarter or something like that, you know? And so I had been to stuff, but it was weird how my heart never heard the gospel, never heard it. And then at the end of my senior year, this same friend I had grown up with invited me to an end of school type revival. It was actually more around Easter, but uh, at first I told her no. And, you know, my speech was not real flowery. And so she was, you know, she still was pretty persistent. And she assured me that other people that were worse than me were going. And so I believed her and I went with her that night. And for the first time I heard about Jesus coming again, that preacher preached it. And it was the first time my heart really heard something, but it scared me so bad that I ran out of that church instead of responding to just as I am on the 60th births, I ran straight out of the church and ran into my little van, went to Junior's house. And I, I stayed on his couch that night while I was introduced to the first time to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was talking to me. He verbally, I don't know if it was audible, but it seemed audible to me. And he was saying things like, Jesus is coming and you're not ready. If you die, Lisa, you're not ready. And uh, finally about, it was probably two or three in the morning. I said, please, Jesus, uh, don't come tonight. And I'll find a preacher and get saved in the morning. <laughs> I wasn't sure what saved really looked like. So anyway, the voice stopped. I went to sleep, but at seven the next morning, it was like a buzzer went off in my head, woke me up. And I was thinking about how horrible the night was. And I was glad it was over when the voice said to me, Lisa, remember what you said last night? And I thought, oh my, he's here. He's still here. So I threw some clothes on. I drove around to every church in my little town that I could find. Nobody was in their office. So I drove to Hugo, which is also what Tina's familiar with. I, I drove to Hugo to a little church uh, that had been like the one my mother had taken us to when we were young. And that particular type of denomination typically does not believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit or the power of God. But just as Tina talked about, uh, their lives have been impacted by a rhema. And so the charismatic movement had hit those pastors. And even though they've been pastors for many, many years, they'd only been saved and filled with the spirit for a year. Can you imagine being in the ministry and not being saved? But they weren't born again. In fact, their marriage was a product of an affair while he was in the ministry and both of them were married. So anyway, um, he led me to the Lord and the next, uh, that was on a Saturday. On a Sunday, I went back to the little church service and I made my friend Junior go with me. <laughs> he was not happy. And uh, cause I was gonna get baptized after church. And I told him, I'll be the only one there if you don't go with me. And so I, I shamed him into going. And uh, he got saved that morning. And after church, they took me to the lake and got baptized and boy, was it cold. And on the way back, the pastor's wife, it was just Junior and, me and the pastor's wife and the pastor, the pastor's wife said to me, have you heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know, since, you know, have you ever heard of that? Were you speaking tongues? And I said, no, I've never heard of that. What is it? And so she tried to explain to me and said, why don't y'all hang around and come to the little Bible study tonight? You'll see people that this has happened to. So out of sheer curiosity, I stayed, Junior and I stayed, and this little handful of people out of the church, not many, it was probably four or five, they gathered and they prayed real quietly in tongues and real respectfully, you know, with their little hands raised. And I just remember, you know, that scripture, watch and pray. They prayed and I watched for that whole time. But, but the thing was, even though this was so unfamiliar to me, I could feel something that felt familiar, that felt like it was good. And so after service was over, I asked uh, the pastor's wife how I could receive this and get this. And so she told me, and that night I went to where I was staying and I climbed up in the middle of a bed and I asked the Lord to fill me and I was gloriously filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem with this, which there really is no problem, 
But what seemed like a problem at the time is that these two spirits that occupied me had owned me for the majority of my life. And now they didn't own me anymore. And they were really, really put out with me getting born again because they were still, they were still occupying, but they didn't own me. So I wasn't possessed. Possess is a real strong word because it denotes ownership. And the ownership of those devils had been broken. But I didn't know it because I didn't realize what they were. So anyway, um, I had three days of real bad misery because there was this war, just this war that I, I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know what it was. You know, I was so unfamiliar with spiritual things. I was so ignorant of everything. I didn't, and when the pastor asked me where I wanted to be baptized, I said, well, where was Jesus baptized? Because, you know, he's my new squeeze, right? And he said, the River Jordan. I said, well, do we have that here? And he tried not to laugh, but did not successfully not laugh at me. Anyway, I was so ignorant of God's word. So anyway, um, I started not to go back to church. It was so horrible. But the Holy Spirit, you know, he compelled me and I went and the pastors were waiting for me. And they said to me, they said, do, you know, they started doing this. And I'm like, oh, gosh, when the preacher does this and takes you to the office, it's like one of the principal's office. You know, I thought I was in bad trouble. And they said, Lisa, we think that demons are bothering you. Well, now they had come into the Lord and the charismatic movement. They were not afraid of, the, of what the demonic looked like. They they probably know less than we know right now, but you know what? They were bold as a lion. And they said, can we pray for you? I said, is that what this is? Is that what's bothering me? And they said, yes. And so I went into their office and of course, now I know some things that I didn't know then and they didn't know. Um, and they began to pray for me and I blacked out. And when I came to, I am screaming at the top of my lungs. I had no idea. I'm in the floor. I had no idea what's happened. But when I came up from that, I was totally free. Uh, never again did the sin of that perverse spirit drive me, never. And uh, all of the symptomatic things that went with it, we won't even go into, it all disappeared, it left. And the hatred that I seemed to feel, you know, I mean, I, I was good to people, but there was this underlying hatred that I, I couldn't explain. I didn't even know where it came from, you know, because... Typically, I really did like people, but it was just this strange thing. All that was gone. And uh, I, I mean, outside of my initial salvation where sin fell off of me, the baptism power where I felt power enter me, that deliverance was hands down one of the most incredible, life-changing, life-altering things that ever happened to me. And so... You know, all of a sudden, I am very well aware that people are bothered by these things. And, and you know, it almost, I didn't really know what to do with it because I didn't understand what to do. But um, I wanted to tell you that piece because after that, my awareness was heightened. I was very heightened to if other people had them. And they got very heightened towards me. It's like, I didn't understand what was going on, but see, I was playing in clubs, right? That was my living. So being born again and being filled with spirit and delivered, I had no idea maybe going into the club wasn't a good thing, you know, at least not in the capacity that I went before as a living. And so the, uh, I was telling Tina the first time we went back into the club, club playing back in that bar, that dive back uh, in the boondocks, um, I watched, uh, you know, a man that I, I know, he was a few years older than me get gutted, you know, uh, over a $5 pool game and died and bled to death on the floor. And here I was party to this and I just had this new experience. And uh, so I went back one more time, but the next experience drove me off for good. I would not go back after that. So, but the next experience was where um, we were playing on the platform and it was a packed house and they always kept the lights real dark and there's reasons for that. And the black lights, you know, you can see the whites and stuff. That's about all. And, and while we were playing, I'm a bass. I, I play bass and uh, I was vocalist too. And while we were playing, it was like, I don't want to call it an anointing, but I don't know what else to call it. That an anointing that was not a God anointing just came on me. And I began to play things on that bass. I didn't know how to play. And it weirded me out. I was like, what just happened? Because now I'm sensitive. And I looked up and there was, now back in the day, homosexuality was not a thing in the boondocks. That'd get you killed in the boondocks. 
in the rednecks. But here, right in front of us was a homosexual couple and they were milking it for all it was worth in the front of the platform. And I was shocked because, you know, I'd never seen anything like that. So that was shocking to me. Then all of a sudden I saw movement around the top of the bar, the ceiling in the, the main dance area. And when my eyes focused, I could see teeth and I could see fangs and I could see eyes and I could see nails. And there were these monkey, <laughs> y'all believe it, don't believe it, but there were these monkey-like creatures and they were all along the tops of this bar. And when, when I guess, I don't know if I really saw it or did I see a vision? I don't know, I still don't know. But I, what I did see that looked like it was real was them climbing down the walls. They were coming down the walls like this and they were climbing onto the people that were on the dance floor. They were climbing up their bodies and hanging on their backs and that lesbian, uh, couple, not lesbian, they were men, but the homosexual couple that was up there, it, I saw them come along the dance floor and they climbed up onto the backs of these men. They were climbing onto the laps of people that were sitting around the uh, you know, edge of the bar areas uh, you know, at tables. And they were, on, they were on the backs of women that were with the men. And I freaked out. I freaked out. We're in the middle of a song. I dropped my bass and I run outside. And when I got outside, I was surrounded by a group of men. They began to grab me. I, I started screaming in this big, big, big looking bouncer. I promise you, we'd worked there on and off for years. I had never seen this man. This big, big bouncer, big as the door. He came and when he stood at the door, they looked up and saw him and they left me alone. They just scattered like cockroaches. I ran and I jumped in my van and I was in a fetal position, crying so hard. And the guys are trying to finish the set, figure out what in the world happened to me and find me. And I never would go back in there. I said, I'm never going back to that place ever. I will not go back in there. And they're like, why? I said, because there's monkeys in there. And they thought I was out of my mind. They're like, do we need to take you to a hospital? I'm like, take me somewhere. Just get me out of here. And uh, so I wouldn't go back. And then, so I decided that maybe supper clubs was the way to go. You know, that's, maybe there wouldn't be those monkeys in there. Well, high class drunks, it's pretty much the same thing, but I didn't see monkeys in there. But however, I had learned one gospel song by that time. And on a break, I asked Junior, I said, hey, can I do my one gospel song? He said, sure. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey because I, I did this song, Rise Again, which is about the crucifixion. Let me just uh, give you a hint. The crucifixion does not go well with people who have an agenda for sin in the middle of a bar. And so they begin to cuss me, get up, slam their drinks down, slam their tables and leave. And of course, the um, the owner was very, very upset. So we can see him beeline coming, you know, and he told me if I ever did that, we didn't have a job. If I ever did that again, I told him if I couldn't do it there, I didn't want, want the job. And I got us fired that night. And so that was the end of my illustrious career because, uh, and I had signed a couple of uh, recording and uh, writing contracts in Oklahoma city. I was well on my way to a musical career. Um, and I was already in process of doing demos and all the stuff that you do when you're launching a career. And here I got interrupted. I got interrupted by Jesus <laughs> and I got interrupted. So from that point forward, um, our, our little pastors at the church in Hugo got kicked out because they were teaching the charismatic message in a church that didn't want it. And when all that got back around to the powers that be, they got the left foot of fellowship. So we had to try to find another place to go to church and we didn't know who believed in miracles. And by this time we decided that was the way we were going to go. And so I just told the guys in the band, most all, all of them, except I think one at that time had gotten saved. And uh, I said, well, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go down through the list of churches in the phone book. We'll start in the A's and the one that lets me come and see my, sing my one gospel song. That's where God wants us. So I called first that Assemblies of God and the pastor was out of town and his little country daughter answered the phone. And I said, hi, my name is Lisa. Can I come to your church on Sunday and sing my gospel song? 
<laughs> she said, sure, honey, come on and sing. I said, okay, I'll see you Sunday morning. Hung up and I said, well, we're supposed to be in the assemblies of God. And that's how we end up in the assemblies of God. But we found out they're supposed to believe in miracles and all that. But the thing they didn't really know much about, even though they uh, believed in miracles and believed in casting out devils and all that, they would tell stories about people who were evangelists and things like that that did it. But nobody ever told us what to do. And so I kept running into these things in public. Like I was in a Walmart not long after that. And uh, this woman's coming down the aisle. She looks as normal as, you know, as we would. And she seems fine. But when she gets close to me, she uh, rams my buggy and she starts cussing me. And uh, I thought, you know, I thought maybe I, I thought, well, did I hit you? Did I deserve that cussing? You know, and so I'm apologizing. I'm not realizing what's going on. She goes to the end of the aisle, turns around, comes back, rams me again and cusses me and then I'm like oh I think this might be spiritual I don't know what to do about it. then she just went on off but this began to happen uh when they when people had them they would um sometimes they would look like Lisa, I think your service went out a little bit. I know that they're having ice storms there. She's in Texas. Whoop. Okay, she's wait, no, she's coming back on. All right, give her a minute. Can you see me now? Okay, Hello. you're back now. Oh, I'm back. Yay. Welcome back. Well, thank you. It was nice to be back. Anyway, uh, so we were at the state fair and and we were trying to get out of the parking lot and we had just uh, gotten our daughter. I have one natural born son. Our daughter, uh, we got her when she was almost 14. And uh, that was another story in itself. And so anyway, she uh, was not um, savvy spiritually as the rest of the family. And my son, they're the same age. My son kept telling her, hey, weird things happen with mom, you know, weird things. And she'd go, yeah, right. So we went to uh, the fair and we were trying to get out. And there was this man who had the orange vest on and the cone thing and all the cones and he's directing traffic. He's talking to everybody. We get about 10 feet from him. And all of a sudden he starts barking. He starts doing this and barking like a seal and he, his eyes glaze over and he's no longer there. Something else is. And of course it freaked my daughter out because it, and Trey's like, ha, 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 ha. he thinks it's funny because he's watched this happen for years, you know, with the, with people who had demons, but anyway, and, and she's like, what do we do? What do we do? I said, just, just keep walking. The man is, he's in this parking lot on his own volition. Uh, he, this is not my battle to fight. And uh, so we just, we walked on. And after I got about, you know, 15, 20 feet beyond him, he went back to his normal self, started having conversation with other people, like nothing had ever happened. And, and so uh, once, once that would begin to happen though, it would happen like the rest of the day. So Wallace, my husband said, hey, uh, let's stop and get some tacos on the way home. Well, the only place to stop was a truck stop. I said, really? After that little display, you want to go to the truck stop at your own risk? And he's like, well, we don't care. We'll just, we'll just run in and get them and leave. I said, yeah, right. Okay. So we go to the truck stop. We pull in the truck stop. You know, if you're going to find a derelict, that's probably where you're going to find it. People that, you know, kind of crazy. Um, and so this one man sitting outside before we could even get in the door, he starts going, oh, blah, 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 And my daughter is freaked, her and her, she has a friend with her. They're both freaked out. And they're like, we're not sitting here in this car. They go in with us. And when we get in there, everything that is in the building that has it, they start, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if they're a three-piece suit, they start acting up. And so this, this was a tremendous problem for many years it made it hard for us to go on vacation it made it hard for us to do much and early on I didn't really know what to do if anything and I was struggling with my own understanding of spiritual authority and you know how much can I do never had anybody really teach me much about it I did get a hold of Kenneth Hagin's little booklet 
at one time on a spiritual authority at a small or something. I think y'all are doing the bigger one. And I, I think years later, I got to read that and it gave me some insight. But um, anyway, that is kind of the history. I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to see, first of all, if any of you had a specific question, because I have a lesson to deliver, but, you know, I would rather know what is it that you're really wanting to know? Because you read the Bible and you see that Jesus spent over a third of his ministry casting out demons and that they were associated with everything you can imagine from being bent double, uh, what we would probably call a bad scoliosis of the spine to epilepsy seizures, uh, like the, the man who had the son who kept being thrown in the fire, uh, to people who were blind and it was caused by a demon or mutinous or people that we don't know what the spirit actually did and they were called unclean. Uh, Mary Magdalene had seven of them. We don't know what those spirits actually delivered to her or through her. Um, but we see Jesus spent a good third of his ministry, if not more, setting people free from these things and when Jesus gave the command to the 12 that he was sending out into the villages ahead of himself, and it wasn't uh, only the 12 disciples, he sent out 24 at one point, you know, so it was more than just his original 12. He would tell them, you go and, and you heal the sick, you know, uh, you cast out demons, you do these things. And, uh, and he said, I'll come, I'm going to come along behind you. He'd come along behind him and he'd preach about himself. And they would go do the miracles beforehand to confirm the word that was about to be preached. And so when Jesus left, uh, he left, you know, uh, a great, the, the great commandment, uh, the great commission to the church. He left it with them and really basically gave them the same thing. I'll just give you that scripture right now because it's the one out of Mark. It's uh, Mark 16, 15 through 18. I'll read it to you. And it said, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast, they will cast out demons. <laughs> not maybe, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And then, um, just to give you the scripture that I mentioned with the, when he sent out the 12, uh, Matthew 10, 8 is that scripture, and he said, he told them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. So, you know, the, the miracle signs and wonders uh, Casting out demons, I believe, comes under uh, the gift of miracles. And, of course, you discerning of spirits. Uh, I really believe what was happening all of those years that I didn't understand is that for every gift God has, there's a counterfeit. And that's why, you know, you've got prophetic gift and you've got psychics that get their information from another source. You've got... Uh, uh, gifts of healing, and then you've got psychic healing or a new age, whatever. And usually those things come with a great price. But with discerning of spirits, discerning of spirits through the Holy Spirit is the ability to understand if something is of God origin or, you know, Holy Spirit or angels or whatever, or if it's of demonic or devil origin, or if it's of human origin. And then being, uh, then being aware and heightened towards it. And I really believe that there is a, a counterfeit that operates in the demonic world. And they are heightened towards someone who carries an anointing of the spirit, which can be any one of us. You don't have to be somebody who is an evangelist or a preacher. You can carry an anointing. And the discerning of spirits operates on you. And it and the fake one operates on a lot of them, and it makes them cry out. I mean, I've wondered sometimes, you know, where Jesus would go to the synagogue, which would have been their church of the day, and he would begin to teach like other teachers did. And yet somebody that was probably normal to the synagogue would begin to cry out and act really badly, you know. And uh, 
why why did they cry out with him there and why didn't they cry out with everybody else there because jesus had a had a level of anointing on him that drove them to the surface and made them have to react because they discerned it and we know they discerned it because what would they say to him when they would get a chance to talk they'd say we know who you are you're the son of god well that's what that's what discerning of spirits does it lets you know what is operating in that current crisis and so that false counterfeit would operate and Jesus would tell shut up. He wouldn't converse with them. You know, very rare did he talk with them at all. And so anyway, um, you have questions and I don't know if I can answer them, but, you know, I will certainly try. And if I can't answer it, I'll try to get the answer and I'll send it to Tammy and she can, try, you know, give you the answer if I don't have a way to communicate with you. Okay. Anybody? I am curious to know when you're laying hands on people, what is being cast out? Does it try to come at you, enter you? Uh, no, they listen, they want to live as far away from me as they possibly can. And the only, the only thing that I would tell people, especially when you're young in it and you know, you might be a novice, to, to casting out demons. Uh, I've noticed that it's kind of scary for people who might just be starting because they're worried about that. But, but as long as your life doesn't carry an open door, if, if you, the Bible says that uh, in James, it gives us the formula to walk in free, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, mm -hmm. and he flees from us. Yeah, so, so as long as I know there's no open door in my life, uh, those things, they're afraid of, they're afraid of the spirit of God in me. Now, when I was younger, I, I sometimes just sometimes, now I don't want you to get scared of this, but there was times when uh, they would try to go home with me. They couldn't enter me, but they might try to go and see if they could poke around and cause me an irritation. And back in the day when I didn't understand what I was doing, I put up with it because I didn't know any better. Well, now, you know, I know straight up, I tell them straight up, you can't, mm -hmm. you, can't you know, um, well, let me just give you an example. Like probably a, this has happened in the last month. So uh, we were doing a Wednesday night women's service at our church, just a regular women's service. And the uh, we've been, we'd been talking about the armor of God. And so that night the speaker couldn't be there. So uh, I, I filled in because the Lord had already told me that day and gave me the whole thing. And so I didn't say anything, but when I walked in, uh, the leader came to me and said, Hey, this is awful to ask you this, but can you, I said, yes, got it right here. So anyway, so I began to talk about deliverance. And at the end of the service, I said, Hey, if any of you feel like, you know, something's been setting on you, pressing you, you're living with something you shouldn't have to, then um, come up. I'll pray for you. Well, ain't nobody going to want to walk up there and be the culprit. So this is what I said. Hey, I got a better idea. Let's all come up here. <laughs> so everybody look at each other like, well, if we don't, we're going to look like we're demon possessed. So we'll just go up anyway. And uh, when everybody got up there, uh, I do have people that were prayer people and I I just quietly, I'd say, go to that one. Just go stand with her, stand with her. And so we were doing this and I'm just kind of walking around because I knew there were people, they were struggling. They just didn't want to say it. And we weren't trying to embarrass them. We just would put a hand on and pray for them. So all of a sudden on the front row, a gal starts uh, getting, she's getting violent crying out. And which was funny because I said, look, you know, if something's oppressing you, that don't mean you're going to scream. You might, you're not going to, you don't have to throw up. Well, if this girl didn't do all the above, she screamed, she, she convulsed, she, she yelled at me, she, everything I said, you didn't have to do. And of course, all the ladies' eyes are about, you know, like that big around. And then when I went over by her, the Holy Spirit gave me the discerning of spirits and he showed me what was happening. Now, I've known this girl for a long time. This girl has lived for God, but there was a secret open door. And that thing was so good at hiding 
I mean, I've been around her over and over again, just in my natural mind. I didn't see it, but that night I saw it and I knew what it was. I knew that her mother had taken her as a child and had made a blood pact with something for her health. And when I saw it, uh, this, and I started calling it out, she starts throwing up and she's not, I've seen people throw up a lot over the years, you know, cause I've been doing this a long time. However, not everybody does, but she didn't just throw up foam. She didn't just throw up slime. She threw up blood, blood. I mean, a spot on the carpet in the church, this big of blood. And the Holy Spirit let me know that was from that pact that was made. And this girl is the freest she has ever been. And of course, you know, uh, it, you know, they were kind of wigged out. <laughs> That's when you had to spend a service explaining, you know, what happened because, um, you know, people are afraid they're going to do something stupid, but boy, when you can live in freedom, you know, um, and now, but what I was going to tell you about that is, but by the time I got to the truck outside that night, I was sick, physically sick. And I was sick for two weeks and I got, uh, I got into, uh, I guess about a, a week and a half in, it occurred to me that thing followed me home. Remember it was a pact about sickness. That thing followed me home. And no matter what diagnosis they give me, that's what was happening. And once I, you know, it just been a while because where we're at right now, I'm not dealing with the demonic all the time. This is something new to the church where we are right now, as far as, you know, this kind of thing. And so I've gone easy on them. You know, I'm trying to be careful with them, give them time to grow up into it, you know, because I don't scare the liver out of them. And then they can't, oh, their minds can't receive it, you know. And so anyway, um, um, I, I, I forgot, I need to tell that thing to go home with me. And I felt so bad by the time I got in the truck, I didn't think of it again. And I'm a week and a half in. By the time I figure out what's happened, I'm like, Lisa, what are you? you? You know better than that. And so I tell that thing, you can't stay here in my house. You can't press my body. And my body started healing. So, you know, this is, um, but most of the time, you know, I don't have trouble with something entering me. If it presses me, it'll test the waters to see if it can, but I'm not afraid of them. You know, I used to, I think I was a little bit scared, um, you know, because I mean, they're so evil and, and they are a form, the devil is a formable foe. I mean, he is, it is real. Well, I wasn't in fear. I think sometimes when we're, when I'm praying, like, or laying hands on someone, it's happens so quick. And so I haven't put on the full armor, you know, like, like I would be preparing some other times of like, Hey, I know this is coming and I'll but sometimes it just happened quick and I recently had that happen. And I was like you a weekend and I'm, I'm feeling this anxiety and this, like, that was not of me. I knew this and, mm-hmm. and it took me another week. And then <clears throat> finally, when I recognized it, I was able to, within an hour, cast it out. But it was just like, it was just like, got me so fast. Like, I just like, and then it took me like you another week, like, what is going on? So yeah. I just. And then they want to catch you. They want to catch you at a weak moment where it feels like it's really caused by something else. And, but, but one of the things, maybe this might help because I know that, you know, y'all are already doing this kind of stuff so it's not like you, like you don't know anything but what I learned a long time ago is number one live a fasted life you know uh do per do I usually do like um I'll do a fast per week you know even if it's a 24 hour or even if it's a meal I always do live a fasted life and another thing is understand that even though we can verbally put on the the armor of God which I do that I believe in that and I do that but that word is my armor. And so if I'm in it perpetually every day and I'm meditating on it and I'm living according to it, I'm armored up. And so unless that we have somebody that is insane, it might require a little extra fasting. Like I had, I had that happen uh, about three years ago with somebody that was totally insane. They're so insane 
that they can't communicate. And they're so deep, they are so possessed by whatever this is that they can't, they can't function. So that, did you lose me? You get me? You got me? Okay. Anyway, um, so with that, you know, I might do extra fasting or something like that, but I just, you know, that way I'm instant in season, out of season, because you don't ever really know. You don't know when you're going to go to church and something will happen. You don't know when you're going to be in public and, you know, somebody who really is trying to be a believer and all of a sudden they start acting up, you know, um, y'all might wonder because I do deal with so much. I do deal with the activity of the demonic in public so much. Uh, and I have over the years, you know, you might be wondering what I do with that. And uh, that's usually a question that people have. Um, this is my biblical answer. When, when, a, when a spirit leaves a person, the Bible says that it goes around and it goes into arid places and it starts looking for, you know, it starts looking for its home when it comes back. It'll come circle back through. I always tell people, whenever you get delivered, you need to know anywhere, three, 10, 15 days, somewhere along there, this thing is going to circle back with you. And that's not unusual. The one that I, the two that got cast out of me, they circled back. But my, but my little pastors had warned me and they just told me to stomp my foot and tell it no, and it would leave me. And that was my first warfare. And when that thing circled back, that's all I had to do. You know, they came back trying to make me think that nothing had changed. And I recognized it and I threw my foot on that floor and I said, no, in Jesus name, just like they told me to. And much to my shock that those things left and it was a rare occasion for them to come back. And by that time I had grown strong and getting stronger, you know, that kind of thing. So, so my reasoning for what I'm about to tell you is that casting out a devil is not difficult. But somebody who's not prepared for Jesus, it's going to be bad for them if those things circle back and, and there's been no decision made. And because that leaves an empty house. And when that happens, they do come back. They come back in force and they bring a lot of extra wickedness with them. And that leaves the person in a worse state than they were beforehand. And Jesus says that. So, so how do we know? Well, when somebody is, they're just functioning out in public and they start behaving like a seal, obviously that person got to work. That person's not crazy. That person has the ability to make decisions. And so, you know, now maybe at this stage, I might do what I tell you I do with people that manifest in church. Um, what I do is I bring them back to themselves it's like I tell the manifestation to stop. I don't cast it out right then. I tell it to stop. And then I talk to, I talk to the people. Uh, now, if it's in public and it's a weird public situation, I may not do that. But if it's at a place where I can, I will talk to the people. And I will, I will tell them, look, what just happened to you? I don't know if that's happened to you in public before. However, uh, there's something that's living inside of you, and I know how to help you get rid of it. But if you're going to stay rid of it, you must serve Jesus. And if you're not willing to serve Jesus, I'm not casting anything out. You can take it home with you. And um, I've had some people, they, they won't. They won't come to Jesus. They won't turn from their sin. Um, and I send them home with it, which sounds mean, but it's meaner to go ahead and try to make myself look good and get them freedom that they won't live in. Um, now, if somebody's insane, obviously I can't bring them to themselves. Like with the, the girl that was insane, I couldn't bring her to herself. We couldn't get to her. She was so lost down inside that she could not communicate. It took us six weeks, six weeks, me and my little partner, Fran. And I mean, we just felt like we didn't know what we were doing. We've been doing stuff for years, but this was a totally different deal. She was out of her mind. And so it took, and it wasn't every day for six weeks. It was once a week, her Muslim parents would drag her to the church with her clawing and scraping and screaming and spitting all over them. They'd come in, the mother just had spit all over. This girl stunk so bad that it almost made you want to throw up. 
uh, she would set like she was comatose. And when we'd start praying for her, she, the thing wouldn't even react to us. It just made her nuts. And we couldn't get a reaction out of it. I actually wanted a reaction out of it. I thought, let's look, know we're at least making some headway here. Weeks, weeks to, to get that thing and get it out. But we finally did. But during the course of that, these Muslim parents would bring her. They'd take their shoes off because that's what they do at the mosque come in and sit in the big foyer area. We take her to a different room and pray for her. And uh, one day, like a couple of weeks in, we're praying for her and praying about it and taking authority and trying to jerk that thing loose. And uh, the Lord showed me that her mother was uh, messing with, it's, it's kind of like if you were Jewish uh, and you wanted to do the mystic Judaism that's a secret thing called Kabbalah. It's kind of like that, but it's Muslim and, it, and it's witchcraft uses fetishes and all kinds of stuff. And so the Lord showed me that her mother was putting fetishes all over her room and had uh, brought in a witchcraft prayer and all this kind of stuff. So one day I left Fran with a little gal for a minute and I went out to the parents and I told the mother, I said, if you don't quit doing this, I'm not praying for her anymore. And she got mad, got up, you know, went to the bathroom and her husband, who was a little milder than her, said, uh, you're right, that's what she's been doing. I said, well, if she doesn't stop, quit bringing her. I said, she's making this really difficult. And so anyway, she stopped and removed all the fetishes. And um, so we started being able to make headway, but it took about six weeks. So what I typically do, let's say that we're in church or we're at a retreat or we're praying with somebody that asks for prayer. And all of a sudden, they start falling in the floor, looking like they're having a seizure. <laughs> what are you going to do? That's when I tell the thing, shut up, stop. And if I know the name of the person, I don't know, like Mary, Jim, whoever they are, hey, talk to me for a minute. And I bring them back to themselves. And most of them are shocked when they open their eyes and they're laying in the floor. They didn't know what happened. And so I get them up and I'll talk to them for a little bit and just tell them, look, what happened to you is this, and that's why you're in the floor. And then they have an opportunity to, if they're not Christians, they have an opportunity to come to Jesus. And of course, I want to make that, um, I want to make that attractive to them. So I'm going to give them the amenities. You know, Jesus will set you free from this. Jesus will wrap you in love. Jesus will forgive all your sins. Jesus will change your entire persona, you know, and, um, you know, some of them still turn me down. And another thing that I'll do is uh, I'll ask people if they're, you know, if I know they're supposed to be Christians, I'll ask them, is there any area of your life that you've not submitted to God? There are a lot of people who live with secret stuff, you know, and they're ashamed of it, or, you know, maybe they feel like they can't overcome or whatever. And they get an opportunity to decide if they're willing to leave that. And then sometimes there are people that they have had things that have been there for generations in their family, and it just seemed so normal to them. They didn't realize that they were dealing with a demonic. They thought the depression was normal. They thought the thought process inside their head was just them, uh, but the enemy had come in stealth mode. He'd, uh, maybe, maybe they had been on a certain path. It's kind of like I tell people with generational curses, because generational curses can cause this. Um, it's kind of like if you had a sign on a plot of grass in a park that said, keep off the grass. And so you made the big walk around the sidewalk every time because you wanted to obey, don't get on the grass. And then one day you go, huh, that would take me a lot less time if I go across that grass. So you walk across the grass. Well, the sky didn't fall. You didn't get arrested and the grass looks fine. And so from there on your path to that other place is across the grass. But after a while, there's a worn path. That's a generational iniquity. And let's say that there's a worn path there that your father, forefather put there or somebody down the road and you're on the sidewalk and you keep seeing that path, but you go, no, because maybe the path was alcoholism. Maybe the path was pornography. Maybe the path was something else. But anyway, it's formed the path. The iniquitous path of the generation is there. You are, you are free from it until you put your foot on the path. And then what happens is the weight of all of the generations 
will hit a person. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me early on is the weight of all my father and my grandfather, all of their iniquitous perversion. My father was very perverted, you know, early on before he got saved. He did get saved, filled with the spirit, all forgiven, you know, but he was, he was full of iniquity and he left the path and I entered the path when I put my foot on it and I started walking across it, the generational curses found a place to land with me. And so a lot of this opened doors for the demonic. So those are the things that cause people, you know, maybe open doors of sin, rebellion, unforgiveness is a real big one because most people feel that un unforgiveness can be justified because usually there's a justifiable activity that went with it. However, Jesus is very clear that unforgiveness will put you in a place for tormentors to hurt you. And so I find a lot of unforgiveness in the body of Christ, and that puts a lot of oppressors there. So I don't know if that helps or not, but so one of the, so when somebody falls out or they begin to, like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, the big church that I came from, we've trained hundreds of people, seen hundreds of people baptized in power, seen hundreds of people delivered, and I'm not exaggerating. And the altars on a Sunday morning might look like something in an encounter because people be, I mean, this is a massive church, but they would allow it. So they would be falling out all over the place. People be getting delivered or they'd be seasoned or something would happen. So one morning on a Sunday morning during our healing time, which was between the worship and the preaching, um, we had hundreds of people up in the altars. And uh, I look over and some of my altar workers are doing this, you know, and so I, I walk over and there's this woman, she is in the floor and she is convulsing like she's having a major seizure. And, the, and they've been trying to do something with it and they couldn't get it to stop. You know, I teach them people what to do, but they were having trouble with it. And some of them are a little more stubborn than others, you know. And so, um, so I did what I do. I, I, I told it to stop. It stopped. So I asked them the woman's name. They told me. So I called her to herself. I said, hey, I'll call her Janice. Hey, Janice. Um, hey, open your eyes. Look at me. Let me talk to you for a minute. She opened her eyes. She was shocked. She was on the floor. She, I said, Janice, I, I need to know, are you a Christian? Do you believe that Jesus, son of God, be accepted him? And she said, yes. And I said, do you know why you're on the floor? She said, no, I don't. I said, well, something is living around your life, if not controlling part of it. And I said, um, so I just need to ask you a couple of questions. I said, are you, are you living for Jesus? She said, yes, I am. And I believed her. I said, well, then I need to ask you this. Uh, is there somebody that has hurt you that you've not been able to forgive? And she just closed her eyes like, she said, yes. And I said, well, it has opened a door to your life. Something's sitting on you because of it. And I said, if you're willing to forgive this person, it's a decision. I said, then, um, we'll pray for you to make that decision. And then I will get rid of this thing. And I said, and it's not going to knock you in the floor again, because once the door's closed, there's usually no contest with a believer. It's like you tell it to go boom, gone, you know? So we did that and took authority over it. And that thing left her and um, all was well, you know, but she had no idea. She was just living with something and didn't know what it was. And she was hurt. And she was wounded. And I find that a lot of people that are Christians, this is what we're dealing with, uh, bitter roots, bitterness, hurt feelings, you know, maybe they were abused as children and haven't really reconciled in their hearts, you know, before the Lord about forgiveness, things like that. And I understand that because, you know, I had to reconcile a lot of that stuff, you know, myself, uh, even later on, I got opportunities to be bitter and I had to make some choices and I, you know, Fortunately, with the Lord's help, I made the right choice, but I can see why people have a difficult time. So these are some of the things. Now, if somebody tells me, um, like, for instance, are, are we still okay on time? Oh, we're at the end of time. What do I need to do? Just cut it off here, Tammy? Or what? You can tell your point because now I'm very interested to hear it. <laughs> okay. One more story, <laughs> then we'll quit um, for a point. So... There, uh, when I worked at the big church, uh, we would get calls. We got this call that this woman was suicidal. And of course, I was the woman pastor that was going to get to go. And, you know, 
see if there really was need for intervention. I don't know. I figured they'd call the police. I don't know. But anyway, I ended up going and I took Deborah, who you know, Tammy, uh, from Gateway. Anyway, Deborah and I've worked together many years. So I grabbed Deborah and uh, we went and found this, this woman. She was over in Grand Prairie somewhere and she was living in one room inside of these people's home. They were gone. Everything she owned was you know, piled in that room. She claimed to be a believer, but she was very depressed and ready to off herself. She just said she couldn't go through life anymore. And I, I, I mean, I felt very compassionate for her. My heart just went out to her because depression is a terrible thing to deal with. And there's different causes and reasons and all that. And I'm no psychologist and I'm no you know, uh, trained counselor. I'm just a prophetic person who tries to hear God try to help somebody and you know, jerk something off of them so they can breathe. And so I said, well, I tell you what, we're gonna, we're gonna pray for you. Let's just pray and we'll see what the Lord says. So Deborah and I, we form the little circle with her, we begin to pray over her, for her. And um, all of a sudden I started smelling incense in the room. So I stopped and I said, are you burning incense? And she said, no. Okay. So we go to praying again and I start smelling incense again. And I stopped and I said, do you have incense in this room? And she's like, no. Okay. We start praying again. And this time the incense smell comes to me again. And so I stopped and I said, I said, I'm not trying to offend you. However, I need to ask you something. Are you, are you worshiping any Eastern religions? Are you studying any Eastern religions? Are you involved in any Eastern religions? Oh, no, she said. Okay. We start praying again. And the Holy Spirit says to me, ask her what's in the corner under that pile of clothes. And so I stopped and I said, the Lord told me to ask you what's in that corner under that pile of clothes. So she walks over and she pulls this pile of clothes and underneath it is this Buddhist statue. And it is probably about, it's probably at least three and a half, four foot tall. So, I mean, it was, it was a big, it was a big boy. And it, she said, Oh, that was my mother's. And uh, it's all I have left of her. And I said, turn it around. And she twisted around. It looked like it had been broken and glued back together. She twisted it around. And in the back was a big, you know, big hole. And I said, you see that? I said, you think this is all you have left of your mother? I said, but something's living in this. It's living in this. And this is what is oppressing you. And this is what's causing you to, to be so anxious. And I said, you need to get rid of it. Well, I don't know if I can. It's all I have left of my mother. I said, do you want to be free? Or do you want to uh, be entertaining a demon? Because that's what that is. And so she's, oh, yeah, I'll get rid of it. I'll get rid of it. I said, don't give it away. I said, it looks like it's already been busted once and you put it back together. I said, throw it away. Put it in something and don't let anybody have it. I said, because whatever's living in it's going to go home with them. Okay. So we left her that day. She started coming to church with us. She seemed to be better. And, and uh, I, so one day I asked her, I said, did you, did you get rid of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, she said, I got rid of it. It was probably three or four months later. We were in church. She had come, and she had come up for prayer. And so I went to pray for it. And when I did, something overwhelmed her, threw her back in the floor. She starts doing this and cussing me. Now, this is somebody that we have given and given and given to cussing me, calling me a witch. That's what, that's what demons love to call me. They, uh, I'll have complete strangers start calling me a witch. And uh, I, I'm like, you wish, you wish I was a witch because you'd have control over me. You have no control. So anyway, uh, it starts cussing me, carrying on, calling me a witch, everything. So I tell it to shut up. And when, when I lean down over her, guess what's coming up off her? Incense coming up off her. And so I brought her back to herself. And I said to her, I said, you lied. You lied to me. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You've still got that in your room. You're playing with darkness. And I said, I am not praying for you. I will not pray for you again. 
I will not cast any devil out. You will repent or you will suffer from it. And I walked off and I never dealt with her again. And the thing is, that sounds cruel and mean, but this is after months. This is months with somebody loving their darkness. And my goodness, I don't have time to deal with somebody that don't want something when there's a gazillion that are begging for somebody to help them. I'm like, no, we're not doing this. You lied and you lied to the spirit. I had to remind her, you know what lying to the spirit did to Ananias and Sapphira? That got them killed in church. You want to die in church? Don't try pulling this kind of garbage again. The, the point being is there are some people that they love their darkness so much they're going to continue in it. And you do them no favors by trying to cast something out of them beforehand. Be Know that it is an act of love to walk away from them. You can pray for them after that. Pray for them in your private time. Cry out for mercy from God for them. But in person with them, let them go. Let them go because um, they have loved the darkness. You know, Jesus had to let people go. You remember when he was talking about eat my flesh, drink my blood. And, you know, most of the people that have followed him and fawned over him, they all left. And Jesus literally turned to his disciples. He said, will you go away too? You know what that told me is that Jesus let people go away. He let them go away. It wasn't what he wanted, but it's what they wanted. And he gave them what they wanted. And so we, we have to know that as we're working with people to, for them to get free, there are going to be some people, they want their devil. You know, when I was a kid, I had a bunch of dogs. I'd le we didn't have leash laws or anything like that. Stray dogs, I'd bring them home. I had 26 dogs around our house one time. My dad told me, he threatened me, if you bring another dog home, Lisa, I'm going to haul you off with the rest of them. And uh, so I did pretty good for a week or two. But then one day, this old hound, he looked so pitiful. I felt so bad for him. So I picked up a bag of potato chips at Barton Taylor's Grocery on the way home. And this old dog, he was so sick and so hungry, you know, that he couldn't hardly walk. And I thought, how am I going to get him home? I know I remember what dad told me that he was going to haul me off with him. I'm sorry, my dog's biting my hand. <laughs> anyway, um, so he, uh, so I just took that potato chip and I'd drop it and I'd say, and he'd come and he'd get, a, he'd get that potato chip and he'd follow me a little further. And I'd say, go on now go on. You can't go home with me. And then I drop another chip. And this is what I found that people have, you know, when I got home with that dog, my dad said, what are you doing with that dog? Here? Dad, he just followed me home. Yeah, it was my story. I was going to stick to it. But this is how people do with the devil. They play with the devil. They dangle their life before the devil. Mm -hmm. They resist submission to God. They will not resist the devil. They know better. This is believers. They know better. And then mm -hmm. they wonder why they're oppressed and they can't you know, they can't get it fixed until they're willing to let go of the thing that God said he's not happy with. And they're not, they're not ready to do that. You know, so if they're not ready to do that, how can I make them do that? God himself isn't going to make them do that. You know, he's going to let everybody come to a point of discovery. And some people's point of discovery leads them into some very bad and harsh places, you know, and sometimes they have to. But I pray for people in private. You know, I've cried over the ones I had to let go. But, you know, I've, I've held on to them in prayer as long as the Lord told me to. And hopefully they come around before they die. But anyway, I don't know if this has helped anything. It's, you know. It really, um, it, what it did for me was it really opened my eyes to being careful about the doors that we may have open that we don't know are open. Like the unforgiveness. So, like, I encourage everybody on this call to just sit down and, you know, really take account. What am I, what am I submitting to God? What am I not submitting to God and mindset and allowing your mind to be negative, anxious, anxiety, depression, um, self-hatred, all of that is a door, right? So we really have to take account of those thoughts and make sure that that's not the door that's crept open where we're allowing this demonic oppression on us. Like we do have the authority to cast that out right yes. so yes, when you were talking one, about all that sorry again there's one more really big door and i won't go into a lot about it but but we have to really be careful with media media has the ability to change mindsets and even something that seems like a harmless movie you know I, i'm i'm not against television my family loves movies my son would like to make movies you know so i'm not against all that i mean I, I didn't even watch TV till I met my husband and he loves movies. 
but we are very highly selected. And I remember one time going to a movie that I thought was fine, you know, and even went to the movie. It wasn't anything trashy in it, you know. It had some fantasy stuff in it. I thought nothing about it until something came to my room in the middle of the night. And normally when something comes to my room in the middle of the night, I can tell it to go pretty quick. Sometimes they just come to irritate me, wake me up and give me, you know, just give me trouble. And I tell them to go and they go. This one wouldn't go. He folded his arms at me and stood there. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. So after about the third time of telling him to go and he didn't go, I started getting a little nervous. So I just turned over on my pillow. I'm like, oh God, oh God, what have I done? What have I done? Why is he not leaving? And the Lord, uh, the Lord told me that the movie, he said, he told me the name of the movie. He said, da, 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 Ouija, same spirit. And so he told me that I had opened a door to, to a spirit that was of the occult. And yeah. when I did that, that the thing, it had a right to be there. I gave it a legal right to come and stand in my room and not listen to me. And so right then I said, Father, forgive me. I'm so sorry. I did not know. I won't do that again. Help me. And the moment that I did that, I turned and told the thing to go and it left immediately. So we're not, there's none of us that are beyond getting in trouble with something by not being wise about it. So I have been extra careful on that kind of stuff. You know, whatever my eyes, my ears, whatever I read, whatever I listen to, whatever I watch. Absolutely. I agree completely. Um, Another thing is secular music. People don't realize that our government changed the megahertz to a demonic megahertz. It's 440. If you go look it up, there's a lot of information on it. It is not what our instruments are supposed to be tuned to. And crazy Kanye West, who isn't so crazy in some areas, actually turned me on to like this rabbit hole because I was like, why does he keep screaming about this? And they're like, we can put you in a trance. I can do this with music. And we know that, especially Tina knows, because there's frequencies that heal your body. And it just like um, uh, Lisa said at the beginning, there's an opposite, right? So if it can heal your body, it can also have demonic oppression over your body. So you have the music, you have the media, you have social media. I just watched a video the other day. They said that in uh, China, that their TikToks teach their kids only good things. So they have their algorithms set up to teach their kids to be engineers. Well, you don't think they can't do the opposite to to dumb our people down? To make us stupid and do dumb dances and point everywhere and keep us busy and, and have demonic sound behind it? Like if they can't do... Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's always like that opposite. If they have the power to do good, they have the power to do bad. Um, so I love that you brought that up. So I guess, Lisa, for me, my biggest fear is how do I lay my head down at the end of the night and know that I'm not leaving a gaping door open on accident that I don't. You, I, you ask you know? you, This is the beauty of it. You know, the Lord doesn't have any trouble telling us when something is wrong or off, but we have to ask him. And I think this is why the Bible talks about that we judge ourselves so we're not judging the world that means that we bring ourselves before god sorry that's my dog scratching that's okay uh, we I bring ourselves <laughs> before god and before and before the word of god and we we measure ourselves by that not each other not you know somebody else's christian walk but we measure ourselves by god's word by his spirit he is not afraid to tell you what's wrong i mean if you ask him you may not hear that one first day but you're going to hear and God because he may he may dig around in deep places you didn't want him to and that's okay I mean it's no fun when it happens but it's much better after it's over and he will show you uh you know he's shown me when I when I lay down at night if I ask him he'll show me if I was a butt over something you know if I was ugly with Wallace and you know or something you know something like that or uh I I let my imagination uh run dark on something he'll tell me and you know if I'll deal with it right then you know he's not going to fault fine with me after that he's he's going to clean me up it's going to be okay and I just don't go back that direction so we don't have to we don't have to live in fear but we do have to be wise and I think you're right I think uh, I believe everything has a frequency everything every living organism every piece of rock everything has a frequency and and I'm very well aware of that Uh, I had I hadn't heard about the that particular frequency music that's interesting 
but uh, but I do know that you know God has set everything up to work in the way that it's supposed to work. And when you abuse it, like the devil has darkened and abused a lot of things, that you get a lot of unknowing people. I just when when I quit the bars, I quit secular music. You know, I don't listen to any of it, and I haven't for all of these years. I couldn't because it was too big of a gaping door for me. It would have taken me back into something that I walked out of. And so while some people may be okay with it, you know, and they feel it's okay, um, I'm not going to judge whether or not that's okay for them. They need to hear from the Lord on it. But it's not okay for me. It's one of those things. I walked out of it. I'm done with it. It's the same way about alcohol. I walked out of it. I'm done with it. I don't, you know, all of that is behind me. And I don't want to live that way. I want my life to exude power. And if I want power, uh, the price I pay for it is submission. So I'm happy to pay that price if I can walk in power. And so far, he's been very faithful to let me do that. And that's a whole lot of fun. It's a whole, listen, there is no high like the most high. <laughs> Amen, sister. I told you that today. That's what Shane's been saying. He's like, right. ah, I hear birds. It's Isn't that amazing. Awesome? Isn't that funny? I love it. I love it. You know, Shane, when, when she's saying that about you're hearing birds after you get free and all that, what was strange for me is I saw color. It's like when I got free, I noticed color. I noticed things that I, I don't know that I ever had really noticed at that level. I still remember the color though. So you know what? Is there anything better than serving Jesus? And to serve him means to set people free, set the captive free. I just can't think of anything that's better. Oh, somebody said they noticed the sky. <laughs> I love it. I know it's it's so, and it's weird because you, you want to put it in the words, but it's almost like there's no chance there's a word that actually fits the joy inside of you. Like I keep saying joy, but I could say peace, but I'm like, no, that's, it's not good enough. There's a better word. Before, never there. Well, something new. yes, yes. Well, the Bible talks about threefold cord of the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that's what you experience with freedom because the righteousness is this clean feeling, the joy and the peace. It is the threefold cord that's not easily broken of the kingdom. Any one of those things get off, we feel off. But when those three things are functioning, man, we could run through a troop and jump over a wall. I love it. All right, I'm gonna stop recording. Thank you so much for tonight. Oh, thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me. I loved it. It was so much fun. And thank we you. One more question. Sure. Um, okay. So 